Hello, everyone. <laughs> We're here with Marissa. And Nadia. And Nadia. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Devon, aka The Black Airbender, and today we're going to talk about pregnancy, um, I guess lifestyle, and less inflammation in terms of a lifestyle. And what yeah, that, what the cats are like? out! The cats are out, yeah. <laughs> But you, sometimes you do the, the steam dressing. So Nadia over here is two years old. Mm -hmm. And she can form sentences like no other two years old I've ever seen. She says yeah, any word that we uh, present to her. Uh, she knows that I have colostrum yeah. in my breast. <laughs> and she says black tourmaline. Uh, it's really funny. Um, there really isn't a word that she can't tackle. Wow, and she knows like 10 different languages? No, not 10, <laughs> but she can, she can count in three. Wow, three. three wow. languages. She can count to like 14 in English. Um, she can count to the 10 in Spanish, and she's learning to count to 10 in Maori because her father is from New Zealand, and that's their indigenous language. But she can definitely count to at least three mm. in Maori. And she has a lot of energy. <laughs> yes, she does. <laughs> she was never really a great, like, napper. Um, and it used to upset me because the average kid sleeps so much more. Um, and then we realized that, oh, it's there's just so much energy that we're getting out of our raw foods that, of course, you're not going to sleep that much. Yeah, you can dip your finger. It's a little hot. <laughs> Thanks for asking. Yeah. So having her, you were, you said you were 80% raw having her? Yeah, um, it was uh, mostly winter and we had um, a lot of citrus and yeah, I would say we were 80 to 90% raw. And then at that time, we when we would have cooked food, we were still having like oils with the food. And then um, soon after she was born, it just it was just kind of a natural progression to um, stop having the oils and you know just cook with water, you know, saute a little bit with water and. Um, I feel like I've seen like a huge difference in my skin cutting out the oils. Mm -hmm. You want to go get mouse towel? <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, um, it's it's been a, a little bit different of a pregnancy this time. I was telling Devon that I have less of a shortness of breath than I did last time. And it's, I mean, everything's going great with this pregnancy. There, there hasn't really been much inflammation um, with both of the pregnancies. Like a lot of women, they get uh, swollen hands and swollen feet mm -hmm. um, and heartburn and uh, nausea is a really big deal. Oh, yeah. A lot of women struggle with nausea. Um, and in my first trimester, I struggled with nausea for about two weeks, and then it was just a matter of changing the fats in my diet from dinner to lunch. Mm. And then it had a longer time to digest, and the nausea went away almost immediately. Like, there is a link between fat intake and nausea when it comes to pregnancy. Mm. And I also feel like you have this new life coming in. And you're, you're being asked to raise your vibration. Mm. And the raw food does that. It literally is so high vibing that it makes you raise your vibration and it helps bring the soul into your body. Um, and so I just, m both first trimesters was like almost 100% raw because it was just easier to you know, keep from being nauseous that way. 
Yeah, a lot of, um, even in the West, they're taught to, let's eat a lot. Let's eat a lot of fatty foods because we're pregnant. We gotta feed two people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you really need to have like a fat chubby baby. Um, and you're also taught to eat massive amounts of protein. And mm. a lot of women say, oh, I feel so much better when I eat protein. But I mean, that hasn't, I feel so much better when I eat the fruit. <laughs> you know, like the really, really watery fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, so I didn't know about the breath work in the, in, with Nadia and, um, I felt like there was a lot of shortness of breath, especially as I got bigger towards the, the end of my pregnancy. This time I feel like it hasn't been an issue and, um, like at all. And it's really helped me. Because you're going through so many emotions being pregnant, and then you also have a toddler mm -hmm. um, who's still breastfeeding. <laughs> and so, actually, the breath I find helps Nadia sleep mm. when I have a um, when I'm more in control of my breath, and I'm putting her to sleep, and I'm kind of going. having long exhales. It just seems to calm her down and help her sleep easier. Yeah, she has such a strong bond connection uh, to you. So when you're breathing like that, you know, that's a string that helps you. I think you want to play bubbles. <laughs> <laughs> I think you want to play bubbles. Puzzles. Oh, puzzles. puzzles. Oh, oh, Jenna's sleeping, so we can't get to the puzzles. Sorry. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> But you'll do puzzles today, I promise. With Susanna? With Susanna, probably. <laughs> yeah, and she's so good at remembering people's names. I mean, she sees Susanna all the time. Like, Susanna Maybe is her friend. Maybe Susanna will take me to the museum. Yeah, but in a, in a few weeks, she'll be like, "What? where did Devon and Jen go? <laughs> what are they doing? Where do they live? <laughs> mm. So she's on in what percentage of raw? she, I guess. No. Um, she, you would say, she's pretty much raw until dinner time. Oh, okay. And yeah, rarely we'll give her like cooked food for lunch. Because we're not eating cooked food for lunch. Right. You know, and she's really more interested in what we're eating than anything we give her. Mm. You know? Sometimes, um, we'll eat it. Yeah. <laughs> You're being silly. Um, sometimes um, I'll make her like steamed vegetables for dinner at night and like, you know, go through all this effort of like cooking something. And that so, and then we'll have a salad and she's like, I don't, I don't want this. I want your salad. <laughs> and then she'll come sit in our laps and, and eat our salad. Mm. Yeah. Which is, it's amazing to see how much she likes salad. Um, I definitely didn't like salad until I was m maybe out of college. So you said um, when we started doing the breath work, you noticed uh, your colostrum come back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't the, even know that the colostrum goes away. I thought it would, oh, you have a new baby, it comes back. <laughs> Just yeah. like that. Yeah, um, I mean, right after you're, you're, you give birth, the colostrum will come in for a few days and then your milk will mature over time to adjust to your baby. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and I had mature milk from Nadia and then about 16, 18 weeks in, the milk went completely away. Yes, and she still wanted to nurse, but so I was just kind of, <laughs> that was a trying time. Thank you, breath work for that. <laughs> um, but after the first session I did with Devon, literally the next day the colostrum came in and it's been a better breastfeeding relationship because of it. Mm. I'm gonna make some snacks snack packs. You wanna make some snack packs? Go do it at your kitchen. Okay. Will you bring us some? Okay, I gave Um Yeah, so that was really it. I mean, I don't believe in coincidences that it was literally the next day. Um, 
And in my last pregnancy, I didn't get the colostrum until the baby came out. Mm -hmm. Some some women, they'll get colostrum around this time in their pregnancy, in their third trimester. They'll have like the colostrum leaking, um, but that wasn't the case for me. And it was, I don't know, it's just amazing that it came back like that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm hoping that well, and they say that your body will adjust, you know, if you're feeding two babies, which is what I'm planning on doing with Nadia and the baby, mm -hmm. that I should have plenty of milk to go around. And a lot of what we eat is really watery. Mm -hmm. And um, the consistency of breast milk is something like 1% protein, 10% right. fat, some urea in there. Some urea, yeah. <laughs> and then the rest of it is like sugar water. Mm -hmm. um, Natural sugar water. <laughs> exactly. Um, ATP. <laughs> so it doesn't really make sense to consume massive amounts of protein or fat. It's... Yeah, the yeah. amino acids are, are they're, they're already in there. That's what you mainly want. You technically make your own protein. Yes. Yeah, it's almost impossible to be protein deficient. It's no such thing as that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, let's tap into the breastfeeding. Why do you think in the Western world, you know, you're told, oh, we're getting to the point where doctors are telling mothers not to breastfeed anymore. They're like, oh, take this formula, which also detach and denatures that motherly connection mm -hmm. to your child, which makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, that was really hard for me when I had Nadia it, and I was learning more about, it just seemed like everything that we do to our children when they're first born um, denatures, mm -hmm. it's inverted. Like putting our babies in another room. Oh yeah, the, the why? The why crib. would we? We if we're like growing up in the wild, you wouldn't put your baby in another tree. Like <laughs> you would sleep in a family nest together. Yeah. And so we're still co-sleeping, and I love it. Um, I love waking yeah. up and seeing her and little it's so, face. It's so it's so healing in terms of just the oxytocin that um yeah from that you, the skin to skin the skin to skin and just that energy cultivation together. Just sleeping as a family is powerful. Yeah, and babies, they can smell their mothers. Mm. And that smell is really powerful and very calming. And you can tell, like, when I come in, when she wakes up in the middle of the night, I come in and I put a hand on her, she'll, um, you know, nine times out of ten go straight back to sleep. Mm. The only reason she wouldn't is because she has to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and then you do that and then back to sleep. Mm. Um, so, yeah, um... I don't know why doctors recommend that. Um, I certainly don't think doctors, even pediatricians are, um, tr you know, they're not trained in nutrition. They're not trained in human development. Um, it, everything that, it, it sounds like it's more about like, what the parents kind of need to happen, which is like, I need my baby to sleep through the night, like right away. So, cause I have to go to work. Mm. Um, versus like, what's really right for the child. And um, I work with a, a hypnotherapist as well. And she always talks about um, so many of her clients have to go back and relive the trauma of being put in another room away from their parents. Mm. And because infants don't know and your, your brain um, has mirror neurons in it, right? And they're dependent on us. Like they need a mature brain because theirs is so immature. It, it cannot regulate itself. It's not designed to regulate itself. Um, even like up until the ages like of 14 and older you're really not regulating yourself you need other mature brains around you to regulate 
So I, I don't know why it is the way it is, but it, it certainly didn't make sense when I started thinking about like mother nature and what do like our cousins do, like um, other primates. Um, I mean, they keep their babies attached to them. Um, they live on their bodies. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of the older cultures um, and, and more indigenous cultures, they'll do that. They'll, um, I think in like Bali or Indonesia, the baby won't even touch the ground for the first six months. They'll just live on usually the mother. Oh yeah, like in the Is south. Is it with me? Yeah, that, that connection is so important as the, the baby gets older because they're also malleable, you know, so yes. they absorb a lot. Of, we were doing sound healing last night with your your pregnancy self, and I saw the baby kicking. <laughs> yeah, it was asleep until we started to do the breath work, and then they did the sound bath, and then it just got more and more active, where all of us were, like, more and more relaxed. <laughs> but, yeah, definitely at this stage, I think it's around 20, 20, 22 weeks, the... the the hearing develops, mm. and so they can hear outside of the womb. Wow, so as a pregnant mom, be very wary of what you're playing and mm -hmm. the, the words you're speaking to another person, stuff like that, that's so important. Yeah, because you're literally connected, um, the baby can feel your energy. And I mean, it's okay to get frustrated and upset sometimes and especially you that's like a lot of your pregnancy journey is <laughs> you know releasing fears um dealing with emotions um especially around your own birth um and and you know a lot of us are running around as traumatized children you know just in adult bodies and there's a lot of healing that the body asks you to do when you're pregnant. Mm. And if you don't deal with it during your pregnancy, you will deal with it in labor. Mm. <laughs> mm. So yeah, let's talk about that. Why, um, why breath work is so important for labor or even before labor, because I feel like the breath is a powerful bridge, you know, by the time you're having the birth, it's more orgasmic than, than painful. Uh, when I work with mothers, they say it's more, it's been more orgasmic, especially mothers who are maybe having their third child, they can see the difference versus if they didn't do it and build it up time to time. Mm, yeah, I'm really excited to use Devon's techniques um, with this next labor. Um, I use some techniques for my hypnobirthing class with Nadia and a lot of it is about um, using the breath to go through the waves, the contractions. The hypnobirthing also really works very hard to help you understand that um, it's the fear that turns it into pain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we're taught so much that labor is painful. You see it in every single movie, every single TV show. <laughs> the mother is screaming, yeah. she's yelling at her partner, she's yelling at the doctor. Um, and, you know, even talking to my own mother, she was like, I don't know a woman who didn't experience pain. Mm. She was really upset about me having a home birth. And she didn't know that you could have an orgasmic birth. Um, I didn't get that with my last pregnancy. I'm hoping with this next one. But she also did have a home birth. Nadia was literally born right there. Right there. <laughs> right there. It was long. And so I'm hoping the breath work will help me move the baby down faster <laughs> this time. Um, but I also think that I was cold. And that's a thing. Like you, you need to have like a warm, quiet, dark birthing space. And breath work will help you warm up too. That's another thing yes. for sure. Yes. Um, so, and, and there's different stages of labor. Um, there's the early labor, the active labor, um, transition, which is when the baby's moving down the pelvis and then the crowning and when the baby comes out. 
And then there's the placenta coming out, um, but at that point you're so full of oxytocin and in the love cocktail that I don't know, it just fell out for mm -hmm. me. It didn't. So, so can you talk about the placenta and why it's important to keep the placenta attached to the baby until there's no more blood? Yeah, um, so the, the placenta and the baby, they've been living together inside the mother this whole time. And there is so many nutrients that are the placenta is giving its last in its in a way its last breath to the baby and so a lot of people they wait until the cord you can tell like it goes white and limp and um there's stories i didn't um so there's stories about people cutting the cord too soon and that's when the baby cries. Mm. That's when the baby starts, like, it literally feels pain. It's like a pain cry mm. from cutting the placenta too soon. One of the first traumas. One of the first traumas. And I mean, that it happens so regularly in the Western world that as soon as the baby comes out, um, they, they just cut it. I'm sure that's what happened with me as soon as I was born in the hospital. They flip you upside down, they spank your bottom. It's really like, why? Mm. Why would you do that? Like, it's, it's a brand new being in this world and you're smacking it and you're cutting it and you know, and then they like circumcise the boys when they're little babies. Yeah. Uh, that's really common and um, I was raised Jewish and that's really common in the Jewish culture to circumcise your children. I saw that whole documentary on it. Oh really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and I didn't even question it um, for a long time because it's just so normal. Mm -hmm. um, but we're, it doesn't make any... normalizing trauma. Yeah. It's so wild. It doesn't make any sense to cut something that was given to you. So when the placenta is fully dried out, the baby gets all the nutrients and gets the full benefits and it'll probably grow a lot faster. Like Nadia over here. <laughs> yeah, a lot of, um, um, well, not a lot. Um, uh, people don't know um, that about something called a lotus birth. And, um, you want to what? Oh, okay. Thank you. Do you want to? Um, a lotus birth is when you keep the placenta on until it falls off. And it's a bit of work um, to do it that way. Um, and we tried to do it with, with Nadia. We got about 24 hours in. And then I felt like, oh, I didn't do the herbs right, or mm. I didn't wash the placenta first, or I can't remember what I didn't do, but I felt like, oh, I don't really want to have like, a, you know, decomposing flesh uh, walking around <laughs> for a couple of days. So, but we did wait 24 hours. And... Um, did you see it uh, pulsating? Yes. See, that's how you know you're so you're not supposed to cut it. <laughs> it's still alive. It's still yes. supposed to pulsate until the pulsate goes away. Yeah. So. Um, and by then it was it was really dried up and it was oh, okay. hard. Yeah, that's when you know. It's yeah. Fine. Yeah. Um, so we we're like, I, I think it's okay. We'll just cut it now, and and that was fine. Did she cry? She didn't cry. Oh no. No. Wow. No, she wow. didn't cry at all. Mm. Um, this is how we're supposed to have babies naturally in this in this way mm -hmm. you know yeah. it's it's unfortunate that the western society because of the food intake which is a huge part of it and yes. that's why most mothers feel pain quote unquote during pregnancy as well that's part of it because it's like the built-up trauma that you've been doing to your body and taking in chemical foods and stuff like that yeah and and, and traumatized animals mm -hmm. or, you know that's and you're you're gonna feel that going out. Yeah. Yeah, there's a huge release during labor of <laughs> um, not just emotions, but like, you know, physical waste. Mm. 
you know, yeah. as the body pushes. Yeah, because at that point you're feeling everything in your body. So if you were taking chemicals in the sense of, in terms of food and, um, hey, what's, what's the other chemical when you eat the, uh, when the animal dies or something? Adrenaline. Adrenaline. All the, all that adrenaline is stored up in your body. And now you're like feeling it. All yeah. Throughout. And you like adrenaline, um, doesn't it cause like cortisol? Yep. The cortisol yeah. spike. Oh, so that's definitely what mothers are feeling if they're on that type of um, lifestyle in that sense. And it's almost impossible to give birth when your um, body is flooded with cortisol. Because and dehydrated. You, and dehydrated. I, technically you, dehydrated. You, I can't you need imagine. To just, oh. Relax. It's like, it's like pushing out a hard stool, like hard poop, if you want to really go there. Just like, yeah. you're really pushing out hard poop because you have no, your body isn't hydrated enough to let it smoothly go out. Yeah. So you're and constipated in a sense. Animals in nature, um, say there's a deer and she's trying to give birth. Um, she's going to try to find a safe space. And if like a predator comes along and she doesn't feel safe, then her body um, will fill up with cortisol and the birth will literally stop. Mm. She can't move forward to give birth. It's, it's a natural process that nature has put in place to protect the the babies from, you know, getting eaten. Mm. You know, like, th this is not a safe space. Um, and I feel like that's why I can't give birth in a hospital. I would be like, mm. this is not a safe place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the lighting, the... It's just... Yes. It's oh, maybe I can give to you one of the red lights. Oh, so yeah, during the pregnancy. Oh, that's so sweet. I have a thermal bulb. Oh yeah, I forgot. Okay. Yeah. So, no. so when you have the when you have it, just beam it at yourself uh -huh. during the whole thing. Oh my gosh, It'd be amazing. Yeah, and um, I was a little too tired um, because the birth went so long with Nadia. Uh, I started like early labor on Wednesday. And then I was in active labor by Thursday night, and then Nadia was born like Saturday morning at two fifteen in the morning. And I I wanted to do a water birth, and they were like, I think you're too tired to get back in the pool. Hmm. So she ended up being born on the land instead. But this time I would really like to do like a water birth in a bath of flowers. Ooh. Yeah. You said lotus, right? Lotus flowers. Yeah, or I, have, rose? I have blue lotus. Wow. Yeah. Shout out Light Doula. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. Wow. So let's talk about the the breastfeeding and the milk. Mm hmm Yeah. Why do you think what's I don't understand the process behind not, you know, telling mothers not to breastfeed or use some a different formula um, that's not made from you and the connection that you have with your with your child yeah i mean it doesn't make sense to me to feed another animal's milk to your baby oh that too if, you know <laughs> if i had to i would get another mother's milk but you know yeah human it, to human yeah um the the milk is is so precious and so um if you were to sell it on the market or something, it's it's really up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean that makes that makes sense to me. Um, I I think it's just like a convenience thing, you know. Everybody's always asking you as soon as your baby comes out, how is your baby sleeping? And um, you know. I think I, I read in my diary, Nadia was, she was sleeping through, she was doing like six hours a night after two weeks. Mm. And it's two weeks, they're really, really hungry. I mean, they're just hungry all the time. It just is natural. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of mothers have to go back to work after two weeks. Right. Um, just the way we take care of our mothers in our society doesn't make sense. It's, it's really hard. 
Um, and so I think that the, the formula is there to help, but it doesn't really. Um, my little sister, um, my mom stopped breastfeeding uh, both of us after about three, four months. And that's when my little sister started to experience, um, like she was crying all night, every night. Mm. And she was on formula and then it was like, I don't know, six months or longer when they discovered that she was allergic to milk. Wow. Which is like, I think we're all well, allergic yeah, to milk. Well, yeah, we're all technically lactose, some more than others, but yeah. we're all technically lactose at <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's not made for like, us. No, it's not made for us. No. Um, and so, yeah, she was, she was like a sickly, skinny baby. Um, and then when they realized that and they, they fixed whatever the situation was, it was much better. Um, so you said, uh, I remember you talking about, um, um, if they stop breastfeeding early, like it's good for the teeth. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, so some doctors, well, dentists, um, recommend, uh, breastfeeding until the, at least the age of five. And that's about when the stomach can no longer, um, assimilate the, the lactose. Some others will breast. Well, some others will breastfeed until there's no milk. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and it helps build the bone structure because they're using every bit of the muscles here. Um, and I've noticed that like a lot of Nadia's um, peers at her age have crooked teeth. Um, the ones that stopped. Um, breastfeeding early and fed their kids soft foods because you're not um, utilizing the jaw. So this is all about development in so many ways. Like we're not only physically developing, we're having like an emotional development, um, mental because she's, she's here with me and we're um, helping regulate her with my calm brain. You know, she can feel it if I'm upset about something. She'll, you know, she can, it's, it's, she, sometimes she feels it before I, I, I can recognize what's going on. I'm like, oh, I'm upset about this thing. So it's really about being, you know, breathing and being present. So much of it is being present. It's important. It's super important. Mm -hmm. So if you want to calm her baby, you yourself have to be calm because they're mirror neurons. They're trying to absorb everything. <laughs> yeah. So creating like a really calming space for yourself and taking care of yourself if you're a new mother is so important. Um, that was a lesson that I learned that I thought, oh, my baby is crying. I needed to like take care of her needs immediately, but she was always needing. Mm -hmm. And it, I would put her before me and then it, it got to a point where I was like, well, now I'm falling apart and that's not helpful. So I need to just get up and get some water or, you know, I'll make a smoothie and she can be um, in the sling. At that time, I didn't know how to baby wear. Um, and so that's a lifesaver um, to, to wear your children so that you have more hands free and you can move around. But Especially in those early days, I would recommend just resting as much as you can because uh, you're still healing. Um, a lot of women get pushed to uh, hurry up and get out of the house. And I know when I started to, I got, I got pushed to get out of the house um, that I started to bleed more. Like I was, mm. I was healing so fast. You know, a lot of women, they, they bleed for um, more than six weeks after mm, birth. True. Yeah. And I was pretty much like just drops at two weeks. And then I started to get pushed to move out of the house more. And then I started to bleed more. Mm. 
Yeah. And then it took um stress is real. Stress is real. And then it and then it took a long time to uh feel right down there. Mm. Like I don't know, maybe ten months. Wow. Yeah. I ended up like wow. going to the doctor and they were like, Yes, you have some issues, mm -hmm. but it's just gonna take some time mm -hmm. and the recovery process. You don't really talk too much about that part. No, it's completely like it's not even talked about. Mm. Um, it's it's usually like about pregnancy. Uh, a lot of women will concentrate on the pregnancy and the labor, and then you they don't read or learn understand what happens like after you have the baby. Now, because it's a whole new world, it's a whole new ball, ball game with the baby, and you have to take care of this little one and yourself. And our culture isn't super supportive like everybody comes at the first two weeks to see the baby and then they kind of forget about you like they go back to their lives but you're you're still like learning how to navigate this new world and everything is still raw and um you may be experiencing um i mean that's when postpartum depression sets in is when you lose the support mm. oh that's really a thing okay yeah yeah that makes sense As a mother, you definitely want to be supported because, like in some traditions, the whole village, you know, it, you know, that's what the saying goes: it takes a village to raise a child. It does. It's important to be supported at all times until the baby no longer really needs supporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to say something else about postpartum. Um, I'm not too sure. It'll come back to me. <laughs> So um, the subliminals, how are you been using the subliminal breathwork music? Oh yeah, uh, so Devon has some subliminal pregnancy um, and labor, I think. And the labor one, yeah. Yeah, and, and I've been listening to that as I've been working. Um, I like to listen to it as I do yoga before bed because um, yoga to help keep the, the hips stretched and limber and open because uh, it's all about opening your hips mm -hmm. <laughs> horse breathing <laughs> yeah yeah and if you didn't know um the cervix is connected to your jaw mm. so you want to have a very loose relaxed jaw um as much as possible so i find that the subliminal not only helps me remember to breathe, but also to remember to relax. Mm -hmm. And then I also will utilize um, some of my hypnobirthing audios at night, which is really funny that I have literally never stayed awake through a single one. <laughs> I always, it's so relaxing, I just, <laughs> five minutes in, Well, that's I'm the out. point, you know, and you're more, you're gonna be more receptive to it when you're sleeping too yes. as well. Yes, so. yeah. Um, yeah, I like to kind of come at things in a very holistic way. With a W. <laughs> yeah, with a W. And, and oh, I'm having some sort of issue or there's this thing that I want to tackle. I'm going to think about it in all these different angles, you know. Um, no, stone, no, stone, no stone left unturned, as they say. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I want to say, too, that after Nadia... Um, it took me about a year that I finally was like, okay, I'm gonna go see a pelvic floor therapist because I was experiencing a little bit of incontinence with the cough sneezing. Mm. And um, the first thing she said to me was, it all starts with the breath. Mm. It's Jen, <laughs> Jen's awake. <laughs> um, and that's when I knew I was like, this is something that I need to do like every day. And um, her, her exercises were good. Yeah, she's, cool. she's in the bathroom with me. Um, she gave me some exercises to do, but when I really started to practice the breath work um, that I got from you and Nick, 
that's when I noticed a huge difference in, no, I no longer had incontinence issues mm. and I was building strength in my pelvic floor. Um, and even like, I um, did like a two week solid food vacation and I was doing breath work three times a day. Um, and I had my period back, but it was drops, just drops, which had never happened before. Usually it was like a couple of days, but when I was on my medication, it was like a week. <laughs> So it was, and I, I really see a physical difference with the breath work. An emotional one too, you know, it just helps you stay present and calm. And it's a beautiful thing that you're seeing it being accepted. Yeah, Nadia likes to, yeah, Nadia likes to do it. I mean, it's really funny how she does it. <laughs> She'll just kind of like move her belly up and down <laughs> and say, I'm doing breath work. <laughs> Oops. Um, and she likes to do the spinning. Because um, kids, they love, they love that. Well, yeah, is there any other topic we should talk about? Um, I do want to talk a little bit about elimination communication. Have you heard of that? A little bit. Yeah. You can, we can definitely touch on that for sure. Yeah, just a little bit. I just want to say that um, we started doing this elimination communication with Nadia at two months old, um, which is just basically like helping your child go to the bathroom um, and putting her on a little potty and we feel like that has been so wonderful to build the connection because now I'm a, I'm addressing all of her needs. You know, she's sleeping with us. She's she's on us all the time. I'm breastfeeding her, um, and then it kind of became like this psychic thing where we were so connected that I could tell. Oops, can you go get that? No. Will you go get that? No, no, I don't get it. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll get it in a little bit. Um, it became like this psychic thing where I like knew, oh, she needs to go to the bathroom now. Um, and then she was out of diapers at 19 months, but we, we always cloth diapered her. Um, there's a lot of chemicals, if you don't know, in, in, diapers. in diapers that harm our children's genitals. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's kind of like, and Nadia didn't really ever experience a diaper rash. Um, yeah, diaper rash is so normalized. I'm like, that's not normal to have a diaper rash. Like, it's not. We don't get diaper, diaper rash as adults, so something is up here yeah. with babies. Yeah, and um, animals uh, don't want to soil themselves. Mm-hmm. And we train our children to go to the bathroom in these diapers that aren't good for them. And then people leave their children in diapers for hours, like dirty diapers for mm. hours. Ugh. You know, like a little baby boy is going pee pee every 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, so it's just another thing that doesn't really make sense. I mean, in Western culture, we call it elimination communication, but there isn't a word for it in other cultures like India. Yeah, it's just um, normal to not just, be in diapers. They just do it. Yeah, um, it's normal to not be in diapers. They make a sound. It cues the baby. Um, and I, I help it. I think it helps build a strong relationship. Um, and it gets them going to the bathroom a lot quicker. So in, in terms of pot, in terms of training them. Yeah. To the point where you don't practically need to go with them anymore at a certain point. Yeah, and I don't really like the word training. I don't like sleep training. I don't like potty training because... It's a normal human being. <laughs> it's, it's a human being, and, and, and I really just feel like I'm just help. I want to say, like, I'm helping you go to the bathroom, mm -hmm. and you'll get it in your own time. Um, 
Yeah, I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because it's been a big part of our journey, like mm. um, building our, our connection. Wow. Yeah. She's raising super babies. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, she was... At two years old, the, the way she communicates is, is wild. It's At so clear. Yeah. It's so clear. I mean, my... I, I, Your nanny was saying normal five-year-olds five don't really even communicate that well, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I mean, I can see it on the playground. There's other kids that are older than Nadia, and they... They can't, they just can't speak. They just can't talk. Um, and I think there's a difference with um, the breath work, with the diet, you know, it's really clogging to the system to have meat and dairy. And that's pushed so hard on our children. And I think that they re re recommend feeding babies solid foods way too early. Yeah. Um, Four months. You want to talk about the chia seeds? Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I mean, Nadia has a, a lot of her teeth. Um, she doesn't have the molars yet. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, we were feeding her chia seed pudding and she loves it. I mean, she was asking for it multiple times a day. We would only do like once a day because I didn't feel like, you know, it's. But anyway, she, she, she wasn't really chewing it because she doesn't have the molars. And so it was just like coming straight out and she was having some issues going to the bathroom and it was starting to be a, a problem where she was like, I don't want to go to the bathroom um, because it was hurting her. Um, and she, when she eats like the fruits, it's no problem. Like it comes out like as smooth as a banana. Right. Um, so we, we changed that, you know, we're not having the chia seed pudding anymore and that all went away mm. and now she's not scared to go to the bathroom and we, and we talk about it too, like, oh, you're having a hard time going poo-poos, um, maybe I, what would really help is you need to eat more fruit, mm. eat more watery fruit. And we talk about what fruits that help her go to the bathroom, like watermelon and, and juicy oranges. Oh, you and, communicate that to her? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then so she knows, like, if we, we, we'll give her, like, some Siete oil-free, salt-free chips. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, not, they're not oil-free, but they're salt-free. Um, it's rare, but sometimes we'll do that. Um, and she's like, I can't eat too many because it'll make it hard for me to go poo-poos. Mm. I need to eat lots of healthy fruit. Mm. These are her exact words. <laughs> like that she gets this concept at two years old. Mm. Wow. <laughs> it's amazing, you know? And nobody talked to me when I was a kid. I was like 10 years old having a hard time going poop because I had McDonald's, but I didn't mm. know that food and going to the bathroom, nobody taught me that. Mm. There was no connection. Mm. You know, um, so we just try to say as much as we can, listen to your body, your body will tell you. And that's how I got off all my medication was just listening to my body. Mm. Do you want to talk about your journey off medication? Oh yeah. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that, uh, briefly. Um, so I got put on birth control when I was 15, um, 16 years old, and that was kind of the start of, um, me kind of going downhill. Um, and I had been on all this medication for so long that I just thought that that's who I was with or without the medication. I didn't um, think that the medication was affecting me the way it was. Um, so they put me on birth control and then a few years later I was diagnosed with PCOS, no insulin resistance first and then PCOS and then later on adrenal fatigue. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was experiencing, um, anxiety and depression and chronic fatigue and brain fog and joint pain and nausea and 
migraines, um, cystic acne, um, I had dark circles under my eyes. I just, I was in my 20s and I looked so old. And um, when I turned 30, I knew that I wanted to get pregnant one day and I couldn't, and I didn't want to be on my medication. And I talked to my doctor and he said, well, you can never get off your medication. And I tried to talk to him about it. And he said, look, Marissa, I'm the one who went to medical school here, not you. And I'm not going to sit here and teach you X amount of years of medical school in an hour. And I went, well, see ya. I got all my files and left him like that week. What color do you want? And, and then it was just kind of uh, throwing darts for a while there, trying this naturopath, trying this functional doctor, I went to an endo, um, endocrinologist. Mm. And the endocrinologist was like, who put you on this medication? I was taking thyroid medication. Oh, uh, hypothyroidism as well was another diagnosis. And he was like, who put you on this medication? You don't need this. Mm. And um, so I slowly, got off everything over a couple of months and then um, what happened was I got really really bad tinnitus and really bad TMJ um, along with a bunch of other um, symptoms but those were the worst symptoms and I used the the tinnitus as a barometer for what I could and couldn't do because I noticed like oh if I smoked weed do you want to go get it if I smoked weed the the ear ringing would get louder if I had alcohol the ear ringing would get louder if I had meat or dairy or gluten or beans or corn or soy the ear ringing would get louder and so I was just listening to my body and slowly cutting these things out I would I would spend like Okay, this month I'm gonna cut out this and see what happens. And if I felt good about it after two weeks, I'd be like, okay, I'm gonna try cutting out another thing. And and then I later learned that all of these things are really acidic to the body, and they're creating an environment within the body that allows um, parasites to thrive, that allow um, you know for you to feel physical pain. You know, I noticed um, I experimented with like having gluten for a week and I couldn't, I felt like I was on an airplane. I couldn't hear anything. Wow. Oh, you got really sensitive at that point. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and a quick side thing about airplanes now, I mean, before when I was eating all the things um, that were cooked and it was cooked all the time, you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, all of that, and I would go on airplanes, I would get swollen. Um, but that doesn't happen anymore when I go on an airplane. And I went to like China and it ate so many beautiful fruits in China and then came back and I didn't have, I'm in the plane for like 12, 14 hours and I didn't have any swelling. Um, and I also didn't experience jet lag. So I wonder if jet lag isn't really like a real thing. It's like something to do with our diet. Oh yeah, big time. It depends on how well you can detoxify. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because even when you're up there as well, the fumes from the plane, that's also a factor as well. That's like the only point I would say where it has, so to speak. Yes, <laughs> yeah. In the biohacking world, like that's a growing, uh, that's been a, the 10 years, the past 10 years in biohacking, people are realizing how toxic the planes are so we knew about the whole mass thing on the plane for a while <laughs> yeah but you want to have a carbon filter right yeah get yeah. the carbon filter they, they even have copper copper filters as well so that's a really good one. Oh, cool i didn't mm -hmm. know that that's really interesting yeah. um yeah okay and then back to my journey um yeah the i cut all this stuff out i didn't know what i was doing but after about eight months of cutting all this stuff out, the ear ring finally went down a little bit. And that's when I knew I was like, I am on the right path. Mm -hmm. And of course me, I'm like, I need to do it faster. Like, I don't want to, how long am I going to have to live like this? I, I, I need this to go away faster. And, um, 
I remembered I used to get my produce, my organic produce from a woman in Houston who has a YouTube Fully Raw Christina. She had a um, organic food co-op and I started to get food from her and she had a, a book and for the first time I read the her story and and then I um, watched a couple of her YouTube videos and then the next one was Dr. Morris and a lot of what he was saying really resonated with me. And so I came to my husband in the dead of winter in December and I said, I'm, I'm going to try going fully raw. Mm. Um, and he was like, are you kidding me? Because <laughs> <laughs> he loved, he's so sweet. He loves to take care of me and my cooking, my food for I me. Mean, was like a really, you know, he felt like this is how I'm helping you. And now you, you won't even let me help you sort mm. of thing. Um, and I was like, I just have to try it. It doesn't have to do with like, it's not about you. It's just about trying it, I have to try it, you know? And he was like, you've already tried so many things. And I'm like, I know, mm. it's the process. <laughs> <laughs> and by the end of one month of being completely raw, um, it was really hard. I mean, I was drinking my cold smoothie and it's like- Dead of winter. 15 degrees outside in Utah and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> um, But he, um, sorry. The, the earringing went away completely. Mm. Um, and I started to experience you know what is joy for mm. the first time since I was a child, just like joy for no reason. No reason yeah. And that was like, I just remember sitting at my desk at work and looking out the window being like so happy about nothing. <laughs> Do you um, know what is in there? I, I had some cravings of like for five months, I like was dying for a McDonald's cheeseburger. Um, but I knew I was like, that's not me. Like my, I'm, I know that I'm an animal and animals don't like crave. McDonald's. That's not normal. <laughs> that's something else inside of me. That's a parasite. That's a subconscious, like the, um, the subconscious parasites or we call them astral parasites as well too, that sits deep within our subconscious because we're so used to it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it takes time to really break away that Maybe habit. something in there? Oh, you put your crayons in there. Oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> How are you going to get them out? Um, and my skin was clearing up. My hair was shining. Um, just everything was so... I was... Um, oh, and my, my gray hair started to turn brown mm. um, after about six or seven months. Um, it was really um, amazing. The, the, you could see like the physical transformation and the emotional transformation and everything. It was just, and, and um, so I've just been kind of on this journey and breath work was like the next step. Mm. It just seemed like a natural progression. Mm. And here we are. <laughs> I've been working with Devon. I realized I was looking through my diary. Um, the, it's, it's the end of August now and I started working with him at the beginning of August last year. Oh wow, yeah. On your sister's birthday. On my sister's birthday, August 8th. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and um, it's been so good to have through this pregnancy and um, especially through these times, you know, where it seems like our breath is being limited. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, thank you for sharing, sister. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, Nadia. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all for sharing the breath. Peace.